So we have a very special guest with us today that is Omar Matador from Qasid Arabic Institute in Amman, Jordan. And we're going to be discussing a very interesting topic, one that people have very strong opinions about, and that is Ammiya versus Fusha. We're going to be discussing the differences between Fusha and Ammiya whether you should learn one over the other. Uh, we're going to be sharing our experiences uh, living in Jordan, um, how and why we decided to learn Amiya, whether it's possible to learn Amiya um, and Fusa at the same time, and potentially what's, what's the best way to go about that. Um, whether it's possible to live in Jordan with just Fusha and anything else that kind of relates to the topic. So without going on too much about that, um, should we start with a short introduction uh, about yourself, Omar? Thanks for that. So my name is Omar Matadar. I'm the director at Qasid Arabic Institute in Amman, Jordan. I'm originally from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, although I was born in Morgantown, West Virginia, small town in West Virginia. I grew up in Pittsburgh, and I did my undergraduate studies in Washington, D.C. at George Washington University. And then I came to Jordan in 2004. Uh, I came as a student at Qasid, uh, so my original goal here was to study Arabic. And I ended up uh, joining the organization in 2006. And so I've been working at Qasid ever since then. So for our viewers who aren't familiar with uh, these terms, uh, can you uh, tell us exactly what is Amiya and what is Fusha? What is the significance of both of them and how are they different? That's a really good question. Uh, and I definitely know we have limited time. So we'll try to kind of keep it uh, as uh, concise as possible. So basically, one of the ways to go about looking at whether it be this term fusha or amiya is to maybe even take it a little bit outside of the direct context of Arabic. Uh, so in a number of languages, you have what they refer to as diglossia. And so diglossia is a phenomenon you have in, in, in any given language. I mean, I, there's certain languages they've really kind of studied that have diglossia where you'll have a standard version of the language. There's considered to be kind of a standardized version of uh, that given language. And then there are, at the same time, the language community that uses that standard version also uses local dialects. Uh, they have local dialects that they also use. And so this phenomenon of kind of using both of these registers uh, of, of a given language, uh, that's where really we have diglossia. Uh, so when thinking about it in Arabic, and in the context of Arabic specifically, you're going to have a really wide debate as to how we go about, you know, determining and actually putting down particular lines, you know, where does the standard version begin and where does the standard version end and where do particular dialects begin and end. Uh, so with that in mind, you do have uh, you know, different methods. Uh, so some will actually just have a They'll say on the one side, there's the fusha, there's the standard version, which can sometimes refer to classical Arabic or modern standard Arabic, or the two of them together. And then on the other side of that is, is, is dialects. And for native speakers in the MENA region, so the Middle East, North African region, that's oftentimes the way that they experience this particular phenomenon. Uh, and so in, and to a large extent, they really, those terms that, the terms you used just a second ago, the fusha and amiya. Uh, and so those particular terms that are there, Fulsa refers to this idea of kind of eloquent speech, eloquent language, and Amiya, or sometimes they'll also use the term Dadija, refers to something that's, that refers to, say, language that's used by the general masses, or it's kind of a general language, or it's, it's common. That dichotomy uh, is really where most native speakers, that's how they kind of experience it themselves. And even the term modern standard Arabic, that's really a Western term. Uh, you know, if you were to actually come to native speakers and, and, and mention the term to them, for example, you know, MSA or Al-Lugla Arabi and Mu'asira, for example, it's not a term that they use. It's really coming from the outside and looking in. Uh, so those who are studying Arabic as linguists or, you know, as in, in the field of second language acquisition, SLA, this is a term that'll probably come up. It's a, it's a type of linguistic taxonomy where they're trying to divide things uh, into particular categories so they can be understood uh, a little bit better. Uh, and so to that extent that this term of modern standard Arabic has kind of come about, th that's one way of looking at it on the, on the two sides, full and Amiya. And then you have others uh, who've, who've tried to actually get a little more detailed going with that taxonomy. Uh, specifically, there's, there's a pretty famous um, paper uh, that was written, article written in the 70s, I believe, by the Egyptian scholar al-Bedawi, uh, which is referring to these categories of, uh, of Arabic, but on, along a continuum. And so there he actually identifies five uh, categories of Arabic, almost five registers uh, that are there. Uh, so he has on the one side uh, classical Arabic. The first one is Lugat Arabiya, for example, Klasikia or Turathia. Uh, I think that's the term they use is Turathia. 
لغة التراث which is the idea of tradition and then he has a لغة العربية المعاصرة so the modern Arabic and the two of those can oftentimes uh, people will, will use that uh, that one catch term of فصحى for them and then further along the spectrum he has uh, what's, what he refers to as the عامية المثقفين it's the dialect of educated um, Arabic speakers sometimes you have also it's, it's referred to as educated spoken Arabic Others refer to it as formal spoken Arabic. It's a term uh, that's there, which is referring to a particular blend that native speakers make between Fusha or modern standard Arabic and their local dialect in particular settings, oftentimes say semi-formal settings. That as well, I mean, as a as a caveat, I mean, there, there's a debate in the field as well. Does you know, does ESA, this idea of educated spoken Arabic, does it, does it even exist? I mean, there's there's a debate about that, but it's something that people talk about. And then you have further along that continuum, he refers to Amit al Mutanawirin, so the dialect of those who have, uh, they're literate, they have some form of education, but normally probably not more than a secondary education. And then the last part of the continuum is what he refers to as Amit al Ummiyin, the dialect of uh, probably uh, best translation, say unlettered um, speakers of the language. Uh, so they probably don't have a formal education in the way that we may understand formal ed education to be. Uh, so that kind of spectrum, you can say there's two different ways, but either just the dichotomy or looking at it on this continuum uh, is one of kind of, you could say, an entry point in, into thinking about the differences. So basically, in, in terms of uh, rec when, when teasing out the difference between MSA and dialect as well, to kind of try to emphasize this point about, about how the two of them relate to each other. So there's a term that uses code switching. Uh, so we're, we're native speakers will actually switch between uh, the, you know, the, the standard kind of um, register and also a particular dialect, even in the same conversation, and recognizing that for that native speaker, there's a there's a there's a reason why they're doing that code switching, and there's a there's a there's a value to it. Uh, so they actually will will look at things when when they try to distinguish between, say, this concept of diglossia. Some of the things that the, you could say that some of the metrics they'll use for for determining the differences between them. The idea is that you have, you know, so uh, the standard version will oftentimes the there's a particular standard standardization of the grammar uh, with with the standard version. There's a, there's a standard nature that you have for pronunciation. Uh, there's a there's also an idea of there's it's a prestige language uh, that that you get a prestige register uh, that, that comes with it. Uh, and so oftentimes when looking at the differences at an earlier stage between between say Fusha and Amia. Uh, like we talked about earlier, we can think it's like, like these are two separate languages. Um, but what's what's interesting is that the underlying structure between the two of them, morphologically and grammatically, is uh, in, in Arabic specifically, it's pretty consistent. I mean, there's a lot of consistency that you'll find be between fusha and, and dialect, especially if somebody goes further into it. The main difference you're going to find really will be in on, on the level of just kind of their lexical differences in terms of vocabulary and whatnot. And there are differences in pronunciation. Uh, those the, those will be kind of sig significant uh, at, at, at times. Uh, and especially if you, as you get to kind of further part, like uh, kind of wider in the region, trying to think about it in the context of code switching, that it's less about looking at the structures and the differences, but look almost at the idea of they refer to as functional diglossia. That there, what's the function uh, that this particular register is serving in society? Uh, so with a prestige language, when somebody is, say, for example, speaking in a semi-formal situation or formal situation, they may be using a particular amount of MSA. But in that same context, they want to tell a joke or they want to, for example, like, you know, lighten the mood a little bit, just, you know, without a joke, but just kind of say, oh, you know, what time's lunch or something. They may kind of shift into, into their dialect. And so some, for some of us, we may think about in our own native languages that, you know, if you get up to give a speech, you may be giving kind of a formal speech, but you'll shift into kind of like, you know, a, a local, you know, uh, joke or a local, you know, you'll, you'll mention a line from a song or whatever it may be, that same feeling as to why you did that and why you're kind of engaging with that is, that's, that is a big part of this kind of motivating factor with code switching, uh, where that we're looking at is almost the function that's coming with it, as opposed to the specific like sounds and vocabulary words, uh, and that may assist in really seeing how you can link between the two. A lot of people don't realize that there is uh, quite a lot of overlap between Amia and Fusa as well. Um, especially, I guess, if you're talking about like the Nishami dialect or the Levantine dialect. When I started like learning Amia, like I didn't realize like, you know, like a certain word actually, like it also exists like in Fusa as well. So that's re that's an interesting point as well, I think. Yeah, absolutely. So definitely, and across the, di I mean, every dialect is going to claim that theirs is the closest to Fusha. I mean, that, that's that, that's the grand debate and it'll always be there. To be honest, each dialect actually has a case. 
uh, they, they, they do have a case to kind of argue uh, for those picker points. And, and you'll find that, uh, that there is a significant overlap. And especially as you get further into say, that's the study of classical Arabic, uh, you know, finding that in the Arabian Peninsula, you had all these, the, the term that they use in classical texts is they refer to, as, refer to them as lughat. Uh, and so it's, it's a lugha that they, they would have. Uh, so literally different languages uh, amongst, amongst the Arab, but the, but the tribes themselves had all these different ways of pronouncing things. They had different vocabulary words for the, for the same thing. They had different structures as well, whether they be grammatical or morphological structures that they had. Uh, and so that particular, you could say difference still exists in the dialects. Uh, and so, yeah, so there's a significant amount of overlap that's there. I, I think when I was uh, studying classical Arabic as well, I think the, the question um, that a lot of us had was that th did people like in the past uh, speak in Amiya or did they speak in, in <laughs> Fusa? Um, but you, you just kind of mentioned that, like, you know, even back then, like people had like their different dialects. So that's kind of like, you know, mm -hmm. um, proves that they weren't. Not everyone was speaking in Fusa, I guess. Yeah. Were people speaking in Fusa at that time? Yeah, so it's, it's a really interesting point. I mean, a lot of these things, sometimes there's an aspect that we almost talk about kind of like, uh, you know, they talk about equivocation where we're kind of using a particular term in the way that we understand it now and then applying it backwards uh, in a way that they probably didn't understand that term in that same way. So a, a lot of the ways we understand the term fusha, or when they talk about it, they'll even use the term falsiha for, for, for Arabic. A lot of this actually comes out of basically the, this, you know, the second half of the 19th century and the, you know, a good part of the 20th century in uh, places like Egypt, uh, you know, Syria, um, uh, Lebanon, you know, um, uh, Morocco, things like that, where you had this Arab Renaissance uh, that, that, that they had which was a, it was a response to, I mean, a lot of things in terms of like modern standard Arabic, the history of modern standard Arabic, but oftentimes actually to say the start of it is with uh, Napoleon's invasion of Egypt at the end of the 18th century. And so what happens, they kind of make that the start date. Why is because you have this, this channel that's being, that's been opened, uh, I mean, opened by force, but a channel that's, that, that, that's being open of a type of communication uh, where now all these concepts of uh, you know and certain uh, advancements and in, 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 uh, in advances in technology are coming into Egypt specifically and then kind of uh, throughout uh, other parts of the Arab world, and so what you have now is in the Arab world, you know they're now dealing with new concepts of you know what exactly is democracy, what exactly is freedom, what exactly for example is uh, ideas of technology, and that, and these are not just terms, that's just vocabulary words they're coming up with. They're, they're actually trying to deal with the concepts themselves. And so you have, you know, an Egyptian ruler who sends, for example, a scholar to, to France to actually go there and study and study these subjects and translate materials kind of back in, in, into Arabic. So this translation process, then with it comes, you have newspapers that come about, you have journals that are starting, you have kind of wide range of, 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 of printing that happens as well. And so what occurs with that is that you have this kind of, they refer to as the Arab Renaissance, where they start thinking about their own Arabness and their Arab past, and that relates to, you know, the Ottoman Empire, there's like this, well, all the connections that kind of come with it, and Arabs and non-Arabs and whatnot, and so there's this concept of modern standard Arabic, and this concept of really emphasizing a standard version that everybody can kind of use throughout the secure region, it really kind of comes up quite, quite a bit in that particular period of time, and so oftentimes ourselves as, you know, studying Arabic as, as a second language, we're we're inheriting a lot of those discussions. So our own teachers, you know, for example, who are native speakers would have learned about this in their schools and their teachers were learning in their schools. And it really connects to an idea of Arab identity and Arabness. And so our concept of this kind of like one language, this one fusha, uh, it's not going to be historically accurate. So in, in the, in an earlier period, so for classical Arabic, the way that they'll kind of define classical Arabic, similar to how for a modern standard, they have this time period, almost like Napoleon's invasion and then kind of beyond. Classical Arabic, classical grammarians will oftentimes think about a time period. There's you know, this, this 300 year period. It's 150 years before the prophet, so I said his migration from, from the Mecca to, to, to Medina. And then you also have 150 years after that, or they say to the end of the Umayyad empire. In that particular time, they use this, they, in Arabic, they refer to this as Asr al-Ihtijaj, this is the period of proof. Uh, and so it's a period of time within which the grammarians will kind of look for evidence that Arab tribes would use these words or use this particular grammatical um, the, the structure or there'd be a, a form and morphology, that this is a proof. The fact that they used at that time is a proof that we can use this in Arabic. 
but that when you look at that 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 period of proof it's not it's not a monolith by any stretch of the imagination i mean there's all sorts of language that's that's kind of being used and so what they're doing is taking a snapshot of this you know this of this variety and that variety becomes the standard by which they're now kind of all of classical Arabic, I mean, to this day, if you're studying classical Arabic, you're in conversation with that 300 year period, basically. I mean, sometimes they say it goes a little bit beyond like 400 years, whatever it may be, but it's this period of time you're in conversation as to how do they use grammar, how they use morphology, uh, you know, even like points of articulation, you know, so, uh, you know, were they, did they have 17 points of articulation? Did they have 16 points of articulation? Did they have 14 points of articulation? Like, this is the way they kind of look at it. So that's the basic idea is in terms of kind of looking at with that question you're mentioning about, you know, does, did they speak fusha, uh in, in that particular way? Well, the answer would probably be no, um, because it's the way we think of fusha is not the way that what was going on there. But in a different way, yes, because that, that whole snapshot is, is kind of taking into account of what they consider to be representative of the Arabs. I mean, there's an interesting point about that. I mean, to, to, I mean, to add to that, there's a professor, his name yeah. is Ahmed Jalad. I think he's at Ohio State uh, University, but he actually does a lot of work um, in Southern Jordan um, on, on looking at kind of like early Arabic and proto-Arabic and things like that. And he was mentioning that one of the issues you find with researchers who've actually gone in and looked at, you know, they'll find that things kind of, you know, carvings and things written on stone and stuff like that from, from you know, um, you know 2,000 years ago, 1,500 years ago, however it may be. Uh, and they'll find particular ways of writing and it may be a particular, say, even like a grammatical structure and how a word, even like the definite article, how it's written, that you've had uh, modern researchers, uh, especially that are coming, for example, say outside the Arab world, when they've seen those, those writings, uh, you know, something written on, on a wall or whatever, in, in, in the desert, kind of on a stone wall, they, uh, when they see it, it will be different than, they, than the modern standard Arabic they learned, the standard version of Arabic that they learned. And so they'll actually understand it then to be, oh, well, this is kind of a, a, a this is a proto-Arabic, this is a kind of a different way that Arabic was actually kind of being used. But if, had they studied classical Arabic in the sense that had they kind of had an understanding of a concept of this wide range of lughat, I mean, like their own type of, we can use the term dialects to a certain extent that were being used at that time, most of these things, all these things are actually kind of present therein. They're, they've, they've already been documented. Uh, and so it really goes back to the same idea that what is kind of your taxonomy? Where are you dividing the categories and how are we kind of understanding those categories? Uh, so kind of bringing it back to like the context of like students studying Arabic though, mm -hmm. um, let's say, so there are some students who are confused about what kind of Arabic they should be learning. Um, for the people who are wondering, you know, whether they should be learning like Fusha or Amiya, what is your kind of advice to them? Like, how should they be making that decision? Yeah, I, so I think that there's two things that students should really always keep in mind during their, uh, their study of Arabic. So one is that for making and creating and delineating immediate or I should say short term and long term goals, oftentimes it's really helpful to sit down, you know, have kind of a moment of reflection and think about, you know, well, what is the Arabic speaking person that I want to be five years from now, seven years from now, 10 years from now? And actually imagine oneself in that circumstance, what am I doing with the language? What am I practically doing? Am I talking with somebody else? Am I writing an email? Am I writing a book? Am I reading, you know, kind of a classical text? Uh, what exactly am I doing with the language? And the more specific I can get with that scenario, the better. Uh, if I can really identify a scenario in which I'm actually really using the language, you almost want to think about, you know, you're you're gonna you're gonna buy some sort of device, you know, at, at, at a store. What exactly will you be doing with that device? Think about language in that same way as a tool. How will I be using that tool? Once we've kind of identified that, then we can reverse engineer and think about, all right, if that's my goal in the future, where exactly do I want to start now? What exactly do I want to do right now? That's really going to lead me in the direction of going towards that. Uh, and being as effective as possible and, and, and using my time as wisely as I can. So oftentimes I think for many of us as, as, as you know, students and, and those working in the field, we may think of things in the general sense that, well, I want to go into diplomacy or I want to be a journalist or I want to work with NGOs or I want to go into 
uh, the academy, for example, to be an academic and work with classical texts, or I'm, I'm studying Arabic, for example, for reasons of personal piety. They're general concepts, but we haven't actually sat down and thought about even within that general category, what do I practically want to do with the language? So that I think would be the first step for many of us. And it's really helpful to actually sit down and really think about it. And if one is finding it difficult to think about themselves, to speak to somebody about it, you know, sit down and have a conversation and let that conversation be a moment where your, your ideas are coming forth uh, and you're really starting to think about what you want to do with the language. That's probably the first thing. And the second thing, and this is going to require some balance because it does, uh, there's a bit of a kind of, you, know, you could say, a tug of war between these two points. Because on this first point, there's an idea that there's a goal I have in the future. I want to reverse and engineer, have a trajectory and work towards that from now. And that really lines up. I'm sure many of us by now have heard of this idea of, you know, mastery and you have to have 10,000 hours to kind of master something. And, and it's always this idea that you have a goal in mind and now you want to start practicing that. You want to engage in deliberate practice that'll take you towards that goal. Uh, th there's That's one way of looking at how we... You know, get better at maybe a whole kind of range of things. But there's another way, uh, and there's actually a book about it called Range by David Epstein, uh, which I think is really useful um, for, for many of us. We want to look into studying language, which is that oftentimes when we really progress in anything, especially something like language, that we need to have a range of skills. And we oftentimes don't really realize what it is that we want to do when we first get into language study. When we first get into language study, we're oftentimes going to have to listen to those around us, our instructors, our fellow classmates, you know, we're in year one, somebody's in year two. As far as we're concerned, the year two student is, you know, just they've they've done everything and we, we just kind of um, obey any of the, the advice that they have because they seem to know so much more than we do. And so we may take on ideas and, and roles and concepts of what's the best way to go about studying Arabic or what we actually want to do with the language based on other people's experiences. But if we allow ourselves to actually have a range of experiences, to actually to look into different registers of Arabic, to look into different contexts in which Arabic is used, to not really pigeonhole ourselves into, to touch on that continuum, the idea that I'm an MSA person, or I'm a dialect person, or I'm a classical Arabic person, and to limit ourselves there, but to allow ourselves to expand a little bit, one that really assists us in in you know, giving ourselves the opportunity to actually realize that there may be a whole, you know, range and a whole host of, of uses and goals and tools that are from Arabic that we haven't ever thought of. And so we actually kind of expose ourselves to that. The second thing, and this is a little more subtle, uh, but it's, it's really important uh, in, in the study of language, is that in, in these contexts, this whole, this idea of you have, say, 10,000 hours towards mastery, and then you have people who are, that are dabbling in different things on, 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 the, on the other side. These dabblers, what they end up doing is they gain side skills. They gain these skills that are not necessarily, at, at this particular stage of the process, we can see their direct relevance to our future abilities, but they're incredibly important as we go further and further in, in, in our studies. And so that connects in your point about, you know, students themselves making that decision as to should I do MSA or should I do a dialect? You want to balance in the sense that knowing where you want to go in the future, because you have limited time, limited resources, you do need to kind of have goals. But you also want to give yourself the opportunity, both in terms of for expanding your horizons and realizing you may like things that you didn't know before, uh, and also recognizing that your ability to actually do that, to have this type of range, will assist you in anything you do, even if you want to be an MSA-focused person in the future or a dialect-focused person in the future, being able to move across that continuum, that spectrum of different registers of Arabic will help you tremendously, especially as you go further and further in your study. It's probably worth noting that your goal um you know, what you decide your goal is for, let's say, five years or seven years from now might not be the same, you know, after two years, your goal might change as well, course, which I yeah. think uh, is, my in my case, I think that was, uh, that was probably, um, you know, what happened. I, I think uh, for me, I, in the beginning, I really just wanted to kind of like, I was set on just learning like, you know, classical Arabic and, and uh, understanding Arabic for the purpose of like, you know, uh, reading like books and, and understanding like Quran and the khutbas and all that. And then, uh, you know, further down the line, like it became a bit more about like speaking to people and connecting with them. So mm -hmm. I, I think it's, it's important to kind of note that, um, yeah, you shouldn't limit yourself to like just one thing. And I guess, uh, yeah, you're right to expand your horizons. It's, that's a good point. Mm -hmm. If let's say if someone who wanted to learn both Fusha and Namia at the same time, 
uh, what do you think? Is that possible? Um, is there a way to kind of um, do that? Um, what do you, what's your advice for that? Yeah, definitely. So, I mean, there, for, for a long time, there has been a debate in the field about that. I mean, this, this idea of how you go about studying um, standard, I would say MSA, if you want to take MSA and, and Fusha, uh, and also dialect. Do you do one before the other? And if you do one before the other, do you do MSA first and then a dialect, or do you do a dialect first and then MSA, or do you do the two together? Or the normal uh, piece of advice that we give the students is to actually just see what is immediately available in your particular, say, immediate environment. Uh, so what is something that is readily available to you? Can you actually, do you find a, a course in, in dialect? Then great, take the course in dialect. If you find a course in MSA, then great, take that course in, in MSA. If you find a course that's teaching you MSA and dialect together, then great, do that as well see whatever is going to be kind of the most immediate thing for you and to not necessarily worry so much about this is the best path or that's the best path and whatever it may be recognize that all of these things may feel that like they're different in the beginning uh but they're they're like trees planted next to each other they feel like different uh you know objects but as they grow their branches overlap and so the connections between them become much more clear as we go further so rather than having you know say there's three, four, five different doors in front of you. And there's this, this door is, you know, kind of one color and that door is another color and that door is another color. And I keep comparing between the doors. You want to just walk through a door, walk through a door. And then as you go further down, uh, you'll actually be able to kind of catch things up. And so that's, that's a big part of language study in general. They have these me two methods. They talk about getting it right at the beginning or getting it right at the end. Getting right at the beginning is an idea that when you study language, everything has to be perfect and you're, you're getting everything right exactly before you move on to the next step. Get it right at the end means that you recognize that not everything is perfect, but it'll come into place uh, as you go further down. And that's definitely a much, much better method as an overall method for study. Uh, so I would say that'd be probably the first thing in terms of just see what's most kind of immediately available. And then the second point would just be that, you know, if you have a number of options that are available in front of you, see what you're most excited about, you know, kind of see what, what motivates you and what you'd really like to get, to get into and, and, and go with that. Okay, great. Um... I kind of want to ask another question, though, kind of related to this. But do you do you not feel like if uh, if someone kind of studied uh, Fusha and Amia at the same time, will that not kind of like mess up, you know, their understanding of of uh, you know one over the other? Like, is there another a possibility that they might kind of you know mix it up a little bit? And and if so, like, is that like a huge problem or not? What, what do you think? Yeah, that's an excellent question. So, so personally, and then kind of, you know, say institutionally, we definitely don't think that's an issue at all. Uh, so in terms of, you know, language error, uh, there are there are mistakes, errors, you know, kind of and that any one of us as students will continue to make as we go through our, our, our study of a language, even when we get to quite advanced levels, there are particular things that kind of may remain with us. Uh, and so that the the issue with a particular type of mixing between, say, MSA and dialect, uh, that may be that our dialect is affecting our MSA or MSA is affecting our dialect. That's a part of the same idea of kind of getting it right at the end. And we can actually use uh, an, uh, an example that's used in, in the literature, you know, in second language acquisition, also in applied linguistics. Um, they talk about how children learn languages. Uh, so when, when you see how children learn languages, when children actually go through the process of you know, their own, how they kind of deal and understand with underlying structures and how they're getting all sorts of different input that's coming to them, especially for the first, say, you know, six, seven years of life before they actually have any formal schooling. It's really them figuring this out uh, th themselves. And as they do that, they're not random in terms of their progress. Their progress, there is a, you know, we can actually kind of map it out and there's a consistency that you'll find amongst children. And when they make that type of, when they make a particular mistake, for example, an example they, they mention sometimes in these books is they'll say that, you know, a, a child will say something like so-and-so deaded, not died, deaded. And what they're trying to say is that in that particular circumstance, we may think, well, that's a mistake, but the child is obviously not parroting. Uh, people around them are probably not saying dead it, but the child is recognized is that ED is putting this mm -hmm. into the past tense. And so they're actually thinking that the way they're analyzing is quite sophisticated. They've been able to recognize that without direct instruction. And so for us as adult learners, recognizing that that our, our mistakes and our errors are actually can oftentimes be a good sign of where we are in our progression of language. And so that the we don't want to necessarily have an idea that we're looking at, you know, a the 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 you could say learner language as the term that's there has its own levels and degrees. 
and any and in particular say influence of the one or the other is not what's what, what's so concerning for us what's what's most concerning for us is that when you engage with a native speaker is it intelligible are they intelligible can you actually engage in a, in, in in some level of a conversation at level at your particular level and when you recognize that say one thing you're saying is kind of strange or odd or whatever it may be, how do you use that feedback from them to actually then change your future language production? That's the most important thing. I might go against you uh, a little <laughs> bit there in the sense that um, from my experience, I'm happy with the way I did it. Like, mm -hmm. so I'm happy with, you know, um, that I did um, first half first, you know, I did like a, a year or I did 15 months at Corset basically, mm -hmm. you know, so I studied first half without going into AMIA at all. Mm -hmm. um, and then because I thought like at that time, like I wasn't going to come back to Jordan, so I didn't need to learn Amia. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, the second time around when I came back to uh, Jordan, then I realized I quickly realized that I needed it. Um, but I'm happy in the sense that I, I, I'd gotten to a point where I was kind of comfortable with the language and um, knew it's like rules and structure of Fusha before I moved on to Amia, mm -hmm. because I feel like it gave me more clarity of like, you know, how to kind of speak in this way, and then also how to kind of speak in, in uh, Amir as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's just something to kind of, you know, my point to add to it, <laughs> which no, I, might I, not work for everyone, but yes. Exactly. No, I, and, and I think that's the that's probably going to be the primary point in terms of that. You'll definitely find that it's not going to be a one size fits all type thing. And that's one of the issues I think that happens is that we get a little bit too attached to one particular method as opposed to the other method. Somebody really, had, everyone has to kind of see what, what do you find inspiring? What do you find motivating? What do you find that is going to, because regardless of what method you take, you're going to Arabic, where the rubber hits the road is this idea of time on task. How much daily consistent time are any of us spending with Arabic? And so if we're, if we aren't, do, if we're, Arabic is kind of a start and stop type thing, uh, then we're, it's going to be very difficult to progress. It has to be consistent, even if it's a small amount on a daily basis, but it really has to be consistent. And so whatever aspect of Arabic, register of Arabic, context of Arabic you find that's motivating and exciting for you, that's really where you should kind of spend your time rather than necessarily, you know, taking this method or that method or whatever's considered to be kind of cutting edge at that point in time. Uh, because it's, you know, if, if it's not motivating, uh, you're, you're not gonna have that time on task. Can you share with us uh, maybe a little bit about your experience kind of like um, learning Amia, like what, uh, you know, living in Jordan and, and how you came across, like uh, what made you study Amia basically? So yeah, when I first came to Jordan, so I first started studying Arabic uh, in college, uh, my freshman year of college, that was year 2000, so quite some time ago now. And when I was studying Arabic, that was back in the day, that was the first edition of Al-Kitab, for those of us who are uh, using the third edition now, that was first edition of Al-Kitab. And back in those days, for most programs, there were maybe a few programs in the States, but most programs, uh, they really did not speak very highly of dialects, and especially formally teaching dialects. Uh, and so it was very much an idea, you study modern standard Arabic, if you want to learn a dialect, and they weren't so encouraging, uh, it was kind of studying a dialect, but if you want to do it, go to the Middle East, go to, you know, um, go to that particular environment where you have a community of speakers and you'll pick it up uh, while you're there. But the idea of formally teaching dialect was definitely not uh, something that was really kind of widely adopted. So that's the mindset that I came with. So when I actually came to Jordan in 2004, I studied at Qasid. Uh, I did study classical Arabic when, when, when I was here. Qasid at that time was really primarily classical Arabic. And so I, I was focused on classical Arabic, and that was kind of my mindset. And I continued with that basically until I started working at Qasid, so until I came into a working environment. And I was trying, at least for the first maybe six to eight months of what, while I was at Qasid, to just kind of stick to Fusha and stick to what I'd kind of learned in that sense. But... You know, you do have just real life circumstances that, you know, in terms, you know how, how do you ask someone to laminate something, you know, in, 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 in classical air? <laughs> it's a, there, there, there's, there's an aspect of you begin to realize that the ease of communication is something that becomes a real barrier, especially in, in, in a working environment. And it's something that you can communicate in the sense that that person in front of you, especially if they're in an environment where they're, they're dealing with non-native speakers of language on a regular basis. And so they, they, they have an understanding of how to kind of work with almost a kind of like a learner language. 
Uh, but being able to develop a relationship with your colleagues uh, in a way where the language itself for them feels very awkward uh, is something that becomes quite difficult. And, and especially as an administrator, that was that much more of a challenge. And so I found myself recognizing, you could say almost for just for the kind of like these the, a, a prag certain pragmatism that was there that I, I needed to learn dialect. As I got into the dialect and started learning more about it and then learning more about just the history of dialects and the kind of the underlying language aspects of things and even the linguistics, then I really, really became enamored with it. And it really became something that I was very interested in. So how did you kind of go about like learning uh, the uh, local dialect then? Did you take formal classes for it or did you just kind of pick it up? Um, you know, just by being around like, you know, Arabs. Yeah. So uh, unfortunately, at that time as well, the while the, the, the tide was shifting a bit, there was more of a concept of, of teaching dialect formally that that was there. But the the materials, the syllabi, the, the curricula in Pick general were not very sophisticated. Uh, and so I did try to study. I did try to kind of do some classes um, in, in dialect. Uh, and the teachers I had were excellent. I mean, excellent teachers. But I think in terms of what was available, I didn't do too many. Uh, I'm probably just a few weeks of kind of for formal um, uh, formal uh, ami in that sense. Yeah. Uh, but it was really more something that was, it was giving kind of, you almost kind of like keys to, to, to really kind of almost take things I'd done in Fusha and and how, how to be able to actually kind of engage in that in, in Amiya. Uh, and this is something that I think is also, it's a, it's a very, it's a very good point for a lot of us as well. Even when we're thinking about looking at MSA and dialect, like we talked about before about studying the two of them together, uh, that it doesn't have to be an all or nothing type thing. It doesn't necessarily have to be an aspect that I'm doing all MSA or all dialect, or I'm doing both of them like the, the, in the full sense together. Uh, you can have an aspect where when thinking about if your goal is communication, that there are, there are aspects of dialect that make communication just faster. It's just easier in the sense of, they referred to this in, in uh, just language use, this idea of automaticity, it's just automatic. And we don't have to think about it. So, you know, rather than wanting, say, for example, somebody says that, like, you know, are you, uh, you know, um, somebody asked me, are, are you Indian or are you American? Or, and I want to say, for example, are, are you British or are you an American? I, I want to say I'm not British. Instead of having to kind of think about like Lesa and Lestu and Lesna and Lestuma and, like, and, and kind of go through this whole thing and just to say not, I, I, Ami allows me to just say mish or mu, or just one word that can allow me then to communicate in that, in that sense. And so that ability to actually use particular, even for those of us who don't want to kind of do, you could say, kind of go full throttle with this, that thinking intelligently about, well, what are aspects of both, whether it be MSA or dialect, but I, I think oftentimes it's going, to, it's, going to, it's going to weigh more on the dialect side, that what are aspects of dialect that are going to help me communicate faster and more effectively? And at least to kind of try to bring that into my, my, my toolbox, and that will allow me to actually be able to kind of use the language that much more. So my next question is that, do you think it's, it's possible to live in Jordan um, with, without learning, uh, you know, Jordan and Amir with just Fusha? I think you can. So in terms of live in Jordan and, you know, and to be able to actually kind of live and function and be here, I think you can, certainly. But I think it will remain a significant barrier to having deep connections with local culture and local society. I definitely think that's the case. I think there's an aspect of, even though you'll find that there are different environments where, say, for example, speaking purely in, in Fusha or kind of a formal register of Arabic, is maybe even looked at. Uh, it's looked at positively. It's looked at. It's looked up on the kind of highly, and people uh, will really, you know, will appreciate that someone is doing that. Even still, even in those environments, you'll find that there remains a certain amount, a certain awkwardness that's there in the conversation and one's ability to really, you know, uh, say immerse oneself in the culture, but really to 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 develop kind of a, a strong connection with other people. I think will definitely be significantly, uh, you can say, stunted uh, by, by not learning the dialect, at least to some level, at least to some level, uh, because there's an aspect of just any, you know, any human conversation, any engagement, there's just, there's an unsaid comfort that any of us have. Uh, and if we're using a register that we feel somewhat awkward with, that conversation is just going to feel heavy. 
And so if you always feel that the person you're speaking to, there's a heaviness to the conversation, you're most likely not going to want to spend a lot of time with them and be able to develop, you know, some kind of deep connections there. But can you function? Can you get around? Can you go to the store and, you know, get your eggs and get your milk and, uh, you know, kind of um, do things? And for example, can you work here? Can you do an internship? Can you uh, do research? Can you do all, all the things you can certainly do? And I think you can accomplish quite a bit. Uh, but you know, you can work in, in the foreign service, you can, there's a lot that you could do, but the level on a, you could say an individual human level, how kind of deep will those connections be? I think really, you really have to have uh, some uh, some aspect of dialect. Um, yeah, I definitely agree. I think, um, I mean, I'm like, I'm happy that I learned like Amiya, I, even though I was kind of resistant to it, like in the beginning, um, because I, I do think that my experience, um, you know, had I not learned Amiya would have been very, very different. I, I think I would have been shut off from all these kind of like experiences, you know, going on trips and stuff, um, just being able to talk to like locals and, and understand them. And even just like, you know, being able to be there and then kind of understand what people are kind of saying, you know, around you. It's it's uh, it's nice. You know, even if you're with people who can speak in Fusa, like it's very difficult to force them to speak in Fusa all of the time. It's just, it feels like it's not something that's natural for them. Um, you know, like it feels like, you know, Amir is how they like socialize and talk amongst themselves. And, and so if you only speak like in Fusha, then you're kind of limiting yourself to, you know, one side of the conversation and not experiencing more than that, really. So, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's definitely also, it's similar to even like we talked about before, this idea of kind of the, the, the function of a particular, you know, of diglossia, where a lot of times Fusha is associated with certain topics that are considered to be more serious, more formal. And so that association will be there in, in the mind of the person you're speaking to. And so they, they don't commonly, they have, they're not in, they're not actually in the habit, in the practice of using Fusha or MSA in their daily, for example, talking about, you know, just how, how they're feeling and talking about, for example, you know, whether they like their job or they don't like their job, whatever it may be, they're, they're not in the habit of doing that. And so because of that, while the length, the, the, the words and the structures, they may be able to do this in other contexts, they're just used to that. They're used to, if, if you were to ask them to say, speak about particular formal topics in, in AMIA, they may actually might find that equally awkward at times because they're used to doing that in a particular register. And so when you pull someone out of their comfort zone, that's where it just it becomes really difficult to, to, to make that type of connection. Yeah. Um, also, I just thought of uh, uh, another point as well, is that, um, again, coming back to like whether you can kind of just survive on just, uh, if you only know Fusha, um, I think you've also mentioned this before, is that, you know, when people speak, sometimes they do mix it together as well. Mm -hmm. So like if you're watching the news and stuff, um, they might be speaking in Fusha, but then sometimes, you know, they'll mix in a little bit of Amir. So if you if you don't know like a little bit of it, then you're kind of not understanding like the the, the entire conversation, conversation or the, you know, the speech itself, right? Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, the newscasters are oftentimes you know, they're quite good at sticking to, you know, like a media Arabic, modern standard Arabic. Uh, but the people, if they're doing an interview, yes, the person they're interviewing, absolutely. I mean, depending on, uh, you know, their own background, uh, depending on how comfort comfortable they are in a particular register, you know, how excited they are, are they angry, whatever it may be. I mean, th th those are things that have a direct impact on what register they use. Yeah, I, I, I guess it's really interesting because there are uh, people who, <laughs> who feel really strongly that, you know, especially for, for people who are teaching, you know, institutes that are teaching like Arabic to, uh, you know, foreign learners. Um, they say like, oh, you shouldn't be teaching like Amir. You should only be teaching, uh, you know, Fusha or, you know, MSA um, because Amir is not really Arabic. Um, but I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of like you, you need it really, like, don't you? I mean, um, yeah, it's, it's hard to avoid, especially if you're going to be in a different country. If you're going to be in an Arab country, then you absolutely need it, I think. Yeah. So, I mean, you absolutely need it. And also even, I mean, even those who are describing it as not Arabic, I just don't think it's accurate. It's, it's, it's not linguistically or historically accurate when they're describing that. And it goes back to, that, I think, that point about just there's an aspect of, you know, and they have every right. I mean, if a native speaker of the language, you know, I, I don't want to claim that I have a right to tell them what their language is, what it is, and what, what relationship they want to have to it. But I also need to kind of be aware myself as someone who's studying it as a second language that, you know, I don't want to have kind of blinders on. I don't want to tell that person how they necessarily have to kind of look at it, but I don't have to necessarily take their own 
uh, you know, very deep, uh, you know, connection and experience with it as the only way for me to actually be able to understand it, use it as a tool. So oftentimes for, for them, there's an, for a native speaker, they're going to have aspects of, you know, uh, Arab nationalism and what, what it means to be an Arab and the relationship for some modern standard Arabic and how that kind of connects with it. Uh, and, you know, and that's also going to go to an idea of so you have a, a, an Arab identity that, that goes to kind of outside of even their own individual country and, and goes to kind of a wider area as well. And on the flip side as well, you have those who are really amongst native speakers who feel that dialects are very, very important and we should be, you know, writing in dialects and you know, putting literature in dialects and whatever it may be, that they feel like, look, this is this this is our culture and this has been our culture for a long time and this is the reality that we, that we, that we experience. And so when you have, say, you know, there's this idea of kind of a language prestige or a privileged register that, that, that's used, uh, that why is it considered to be privileged sometimes is because it's oftentimes most of formal writing uh, you know, I should say all formal formal writing, but you kind of that, that type of writing and publishing and uh, you know formal speeches, things like that. It's all being done in that particular register, and so it gives it a particular type of prestige and privilege. Whereas they feel that you know the reality of how people are actually using the language is, is going to be different. So I don't want to tell that person because you know that's they have just as much right to say what Arabic is, you know, in, in the sense of how they experience it. But at the same time, in terms of you know, I think from if we step away from it a little bit and look at it a little more historically, it, it's 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 difficult to say that it's, you know it's not it's not Arabic in that sense it's it's very much a part of the Arabic spectrum. I think I might just wrap up with one final question. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, it's it's more of a uh, it's a fun question. It's just mm -hmm. uh, what do you what do you prefer? Do you prefer Amia or do you prefer Fusa? <laughs> so uh, that's a good question. I, I think for me, it's it, it really goes back to that that kind of um, the functionality in that sense. So in terms of, uh, of, of spoken Arabic, uh, absolutely, I, I definitely feel much more comfortable in dialect, uh, I think now than, 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 uh, than I do with, um, uh, say, a modern standard or, or full in terms of just because the amount of time spent sp uh, speaking dialect. I, I find that most of the time when I'm speaking in, in MSA or full it will be with uh, native Arabic speakers, but who are, their background is from an Arab country where I don't have much familiarity with their dialect. So I'll commonly, for example, say speak with them in accommodation of MSA and then aspects and vocabulary from the dialect, which, uh, which is kind of shared, you know, uh, across, across borders in, in that sense. Uh, or I'll try to learn as much as I can of their dialect and try to use their, their dialect. But I would say in terms of literature and reading and things like that, I, I still very much, uh, yeah, classical Arabic still has a big hold on me. Uh, so, I, you know, I've I've kind of dabbled in, um, in a lot of um, you could say literature from the 20th century and even kind of uh, more, more more contemporary literature. I haven't personally on a, on a personal level, whether it be written in dialect or be kind of written in MSA or accommodation. I haven't found my heart there. My, my heart is definitely kind of in, uh, in, in on the in the written side. Uh, it's definitely uh, in the literature of classical Arabic uh, and specifically the, the poetry of classical Arabic. I think for me, it's easy to say. I think I prefer Amia, even though like I think me like five years ago, I think I would have like turn my nose up at it deliberately, but, <laughs> <laughs> um, but like, I, 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 yeah, right now, like I prefer Amia because it's so much easier and it's just like, yeah, it, you just get it out so much easier and you're able to con connect, like you said, connect to people and communicate with them and have like more meaningful kind of connections with them as well. So yeah, it's, it's more fun as well, to be honest. <laughs> and it's uh, people are a lot more forgiving um, when you make mistakes, I think. Not so much in Fosha though. <laughs> oh, also, actually, I just want to ask you one more thing. I, I don't know whether this kind of fits into your, your, what do you call like code switching, but basically like, you know, how do you make that um, kind of switch between like, if you want to just speak in Fosha, or if you want to just speak in Amia, is it really that easy for you? <laughs> because sometimes I struggle with that. So yeah, that takes practice, definitely. Yeah, it definitely takes practice. And, the, the, and there are times where I, I do notice kind of when I'm, when I'm uh, depending on the context of the, when I'm doing it, if I have more, if it's a conversation and it's an environment and it's a discussion where I've done it more, uh, about particular topics, then yeah, I don't, then at this point in time, I don't find it necessarily as difficult. Uh, but if it's something where I haven't necessarily done it before, uh, then in, in, a, in say a particular topic or conversation there, I may find it a little more challenging. But one thing I found useful with that was that, um, you know, there are oftentimes with that code switching and particular kind of pairing that you would do sometimes, you know, uh, 
talking about something in particular in a particular register and also then switching uh, to, to, to another register. I found at Posit when I when I first started working at Posit and then I first started kind of getting into Amia more and I was doing my own switching, I would get uh, oftentimes immediate feedback from my colleagues about ways that I was kind of making these combinations that they would that, that I would say things and they would just kind of they'd be like, no, we don't, you know, we don't say it like that. And so there's an aspect of code switching as well. It's not something that is going to be, it's not random. Uh, so that even when, when, when they do that type of switch, there is a pattern that's, that's there that uh, you'll find that there are times where they'll, they'll maybe kind of combine between MSA and, and dialect in this particular way, but they won't do the opposite of it. They won't do the direct opposite of it. And that oftentimes you only really kind of, you have to kind of make that mistake Get that feedback on it, and then and then and then recognize it, moving it forward, uh, moving forward with it. But it's it's something that uh, it does. Yeah, it does take some practice. Okay. Yeah. Good to know. <laughs> um, all right. Thank you so much for your time. Um, I think we have covered quite a bit uh, today. Um, I might have a, a bit of a task trying to kind of <laughs> pick out what to include in this. But uh, thank you so much for your time uh, today. Yeah.